Welcome to the Warlords of History podcast. I'm your host, Mark Pimenta. The show that follows the lives, campaigns, and achievements of warriors and military leaders from history, ancient and medieval, all of whom were titans during their respective eras, shaking the very lands in which they lived, fought, and died, while also exploring the environmental, social, and political forces that surrounded them at the time. And for this episode, joined by Elliot Gates from the Anthology of Heroes podcast, as we arrive at the conclusion of our two-part series on Leonidas I. The Spartan king, whose unshakable leadership and dedication to his duty, mixed in with undeniable fighting prowess and a penchant for terse verbal volleys, all together equipped him to command over what would become one of history's most incredible and inspiring last stands at the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC that has since left him immortalized. Now, as mentioned, this episode forms the second of two parts, so if you haven't had a chance to as of yet, you may want to have a listen of part one first, wherein Elliot and I lay out Sparta's historical evolution the cultural and practical forces that collided to make it into such a uniquely severe and militaristic society, at the center of which was its citizenry, molded into the finest warriors to be found in ancient Greece. The products of Sparta's exceedingly harsh training and educational system, called the agoge, that Leonidas would have gone through in his youth, followed by the events that had been unfolding within Sparta, Greece, and the wider Aegean, in the lead-up to Leonidas's ascension to the Agiad crown of Sparta in 490 BC. The point at which this episode picks up the storyline, with the Achaemenid Persian Empire set to launch its second invasion of Greece, led by Xerxes I, who assembled what can only be called an unbelievably immense army by the standards of the time, threatening to swallow up the whole of the Greek peninsula. That did much to deepen the existing rifts of disunity that had long been the status quo for the city-states therein, while at the same time driving some, most importantly Sparta and Athens, to put their differences aside and form a coalition against the Achaemenids, with Leonidas selected as commander-in-chief, who, in view of the fluid situation, the size of the incoming Persian army, along with an important prophecy from the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi, led the Spartan king to draw out the strategic framework for the initial Greek response. Leonidas as the spearhead, leading 300 Spartans and their allies, all in all a surprisingly small Greek force, towards the pass of Thermopylae to block the enormous Achaemenid advance. Bringing us to the Battle of Thermopylae in August 480 BC, a feral and ferociously primal three-day clash that Elliot and I go through in detail, speaking to the tactical brilliance displayed by Leonidas and the heroic resistance offered by his warriors throughout, inflicting punishingly high casualties upon Xerxes' army, before being betrayed setting the stage for a remarkable last stand on the final day of battle, with Leonidas and his hoplites refusing to step aside or surrender, defiant to the end, only death relieving them from their duty. Resulting in, right from the moment they fell, the story of their achievements and sacrifice traversing into the realm of legend, strengthening the resolve of the city-states of Greece to not just continue the resistance, but expand their military response, pushing the Achaemenids out of Greece, all the way back to Persia. A key point of inspiration provided by Leonidas' legacy, but especially for Sparta, with Leonidas serving as the perfect example of one who followed its laws and ideals unerringly, making the ultimate sacrifice in service to the Spartan state. However, before we get further into the episode, there's a shout-out that we need to get to first, as I have the great pleasure of welcoming Louis G. as an honorary addition 
to the warlords of history, immortals. Thank you for the support. With a wider thanks going out to all the existing immortals for continuing to support the podcast through the Warlords of History Patreon page. All right, here we go with part two and the finale of our series on the Spartan King, Leonidas I. Welcome back, everyone, to the conclusion of our two-part series on King Leonidas of the Spartans, as we now approach the Battle of Thermopylae. And when we last left everything off in part one, it was late in the 480s BC, with the throne of the Achaemenid Persian Empire having recently passed into the hands of Xerxes I as the new King of Kings. Whereupon, After dealing with a few internal problems within his realms, Xerxes began turning his attention abroad, looking to avenge his father's failed invasion of Greece, the first Persian invasion under Darius I, that although stopped at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, had managed to grasp a large foothold right at the threshold of northern Greece, leading to Xerxes assembling an enormous army, calling for troops from all over his vast empire that were gathering in northwestern Anatolia, an army that would prove to be much greater in size and strength than the 30,000 land forces and 600 warships that Darius had used in his earlier attempt almost a decade prior. But the thing is, the movement of so many troops amassing near the Hellespont that strait dividing Asia Minor from Europe, it made it sharply clear to all in Greece that another, much bigger Persian wave of attack was about to come crashing down on their lands. Elliot, what can you tell us of how the city-states of Greece began responding to this looming threat? In our previous episode, it was mentioned that there were similar acts of deposing rulers who submitted to the Persians, and this was happening kind of all throughout Greece. Uh, With Xerxes approaching, Greek city-states had to decide whether to submit to Xerxes by offering him earth and water, remain neutral, or stand and fight. All knew this was not going to be a fair fight. Xerxes' empire reached from the north of Greece all the way through Anatolia, throughout North India, and even into Afghanistan. I mean, this is so much larger than the Greek world, isn't it? Oh yeah, definitely. I reckon you said this in episode one, but all the Greek city-states were mostly quite insular. They were fighting their own battles. So this was going to be David versus Goliath. I mean, in all sense of the word. Yeah, you're right. And using your analogy could be described as one Goliath versus many Davids. Mm. Since this brings us back to an important point that we referenced in part one, in that the city-states of Greece largely due to the geography of their peninsula and the relatively small pockets of arable land, had pretty much right from the onset always been in fierce competition with one another, sometimes forming alliances amongst each other, but typically only for short periods of time, fiercely protective of their full sovereignty and political independence. Mm. Mm. Granted, the Spartan-led Peloponnesian League was a bit of a departure from that, but that was still quite a new institution, formed only around some 50 years prior, and regional, only applicable to some of the states of southern Greece. So I think it's more than fair to argue that, when considering the whole of the Greek world at the time, they remained divided, which was essentially the de facto lay of the land, or the norm for the political landscape in Greece. Hmm. And so this was the first time they really needed to kind of, they had to get their act together. It was, you know, stand or die in a way, wasn't it? Right. Yes. They had done it, I guess you could say, to a limited degree during the first Persian invasion. Mm. But even that Greek coalition, not sure if we can even call it that, was extremely narrow in scope. Since it was only really the city-states of Athens and Plataea that had banded together to fight and defeat the Achaemenids at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, a decade prior. But fast forward now 10 years later, understanding the dire problem that they were now facing, 
and the size of the army that Xerxes had been building, this was truly the first time that the fiercely independent-minded city-states of Greece were forced to put their differences aside mm. in view of such a terrifyingly powerful foreign enemy. Yeah, would you say this was kind of the birth of Greekness in a way? You know, it's a good question. And in a way, yes. Since the Persian Empire formed a singular external and overarching threat to all of the states within ancient Greece, mm. forcing not all, but many of them to work together, creating a sense of, to borrow your term, Greekness, or Greek cooperation versus this foreign overarching adversary. But on the other hand, if anything, this ended up not being much more than a fleeting notion, a temporary sense of unity. Mm -hmm. Since, as we'll get to later on in this episode, there was still a lot more bloodletting to occur. Some tremendously bitter and prolonged conflicts between the city-states after the Persian threat had been dealt with. Returning back to the normal state of affairs, endless squabbles among those within the Greek peninsula, including one particularly bloody and draining conflict called the Peloponnesian War, the ancient Greek equivalent to that of a world war. Mm. That would erupt nearly 50 years after the end of the Greco-Persian Wars, resulting in Sparta's eventual hegemony over Greece. Mm. It's like that immediate threat is dealt with and now we can go back to fighting each other, right? Absolutely, yeah. But yeah, I, I think we touched on this as well, but it's worth emphasizing that submission to Persia wasn't overly brutal, right? Uh, you kept your religions, you kept your government usually, you kept your figureheads, everything more or less stayed the same. But I think for you know Spartans being such a kind of binary yes or no culture, if they weren't the masters, then in their mind, they, they were slaves. Did you kind of get that idea? Definitely. And yeah, I think there's a lot to unpack here in what you just said. Typically, as you mentioned, the only things that the Achaemenids would demand of those that they conquered were troop contributions and financial tribute on an ongoing basis. A bit of a simplification, of course, but otherwise free to go about their business as they did before. Mm. And while this configuration certainly stood in contrast to the normally fiercely independent city-states of the Greek world, the scale of the Persian threat, aside from driving some of them to work together, it seems to have also resulted in many city-states reevaluating their comfort level with being conquered, mm. either accepting that as their fate or face utter ruin and destruction, slavery as well. Whereas I think you put it well when you said that even if not facing actual slavery, the Spartans, if not the masters of their own destiny, would have considered that slavery. Not to mention that the Spartans clearly considered themselves a master race in accordance to the divine will of the gods, mm. justified in their domination of everyone that they encountered, be it Persian or fellow Greeks or anyone else for that matter. And in no way was this supposed to work in any other order than that. And so what living under a Achaemenid rule would have ultimately represented to the Spartans was, in essence, the unraveling of their entire world. Mm, their way of life, really. Square peg in a round hole kind of thing. That's right. That's right. So in 480 BC, Xerxes launches the second Persian invasion of Greece, essentially to complete what his father had started. Xerxes' land forces numbered 1.7 million, according to Herodotus, but uh, modern estimates kind of go within the ranges of 120 to 300,000. But still, this is a, this is an enormous army. Yes, right. Even by by those standards, by these standards, it, it's it's huge. You're absolutely right. I love Herodotus's description of the Persian army. He referred to it as being so vast that it mm. stretched from sunrise to sunset. That's right. Draining rivers and lakes as they traveled deeper into Greece. Phenomenal. Mm. Yeah, just that image of just drinking rivers dry is, you know, terrifying, right? Definitely. What do you think was the more accurate number of troops that they had coming into Greece? 
from what I've read and from the historians that I've seen that are a bit more palatable, I would say it's probably 150,000. I, I kind of just like to go in the middle. I mean, on the lower side, I, I think even at best, they were outnumbered 17 to 1. And that's at best, right? That's I think that's going by 120 or something. So Yeah, based on my research and more modern estimates, I've seen similar numbers anywhere from 100,000 land forces, according to others, as high as 300,000 Persian troops. But any way you slice it, this is a ridiculously large army by the standards of the time. Mm -hmm. And to top it all off, Xerxes also bringing along a huge naval armada, a rather impressive naval force yeah. of about 1,200 warships. Yeah, that's right, that's right, because they, they straddled the coast as they went, right? But I mean, we'll get to all that when we get to terrains and all that. But, yes. Um, so the Spartans already received this prophecy from the oracle, it obviously had a significant impact on the very religiously minded Spartans, stating that either the city would be wasted by the Persians or they were bound to mourn a Lacedaemonian dead king, essentially. This is quite the important piece to Leonidas' story and the Battle of Thermopylae, isn't it? Mm. Those words that he received from the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi, I think that you are completely correct when we consider how deeply religious the Spartans were, this prophetic guidance would have been extremely impactful to Leonidas and the Spartans. And upon receiving that guidance, this would have undoubtedly weighed heavily in their unfolding defensive plans. Obviously, it says a lot about him that just kind of takes this news and, and he kind of, that's his purpose now. He doesn't try and shy away from it. He's king and he decides, well, okay, if that's, if that's my destiny, that's what we have to do, right? Yeah, and his sense of responsibility to the mm. state of Sparta itself. We talked about in the last episode how how of lesser importance one's individuality was mm. when it came to their presence within the state of Sparta. Mm. The state of Sparta, their needs took precedence over everything. Mm. But even within that fold, there was this adherence to overarching law, but also religion as well. Mm. They're all they're all just cogs that kind of keep Sparta moving, aren't they? Individual cogs. Right. The assembled Greek forces numbered probably around seven thousand. That's kind of the number I saw. Do, is is that on par with what you got to? Yeah, same here. About seven thousand. So obviously Leonidas has got his famous three hundred Spartans that were selected for the mission. They were considered the greatest warriors in Greece, and these three hundred Spartans were considered the greatest warriors in Sparta. So. I mean, really, really, this is an elite top-of-the-line task force. They were known as Hippias. The Hippias were young men who, in the Agogi training program, you know, these were the best of that. So they were the strongest, the bravest, and the most patriotic. Leonidas mandated that every man of the 300 must have a son to continue the bloodline. And as a lot of Spartans didn't have kids until they were after 30, there were probably a lot of men within the 300 who were much older. I mean, Leonidas himself was, what, 50, 55, 60, something like that? Yeah, I think at the time, as we near towards the timing of the Battle of Thermopylae, if the numbers in terms of his birth date around 540 are correct, he would have been about 60 years old. Mm. Certainly far older than I think most accounts of this battle tend to place the Spartan yeah. king, right? But mm. I, I would agree that that notion would also be extended to that of the 300 Spartans. Mm, mm. Being that they had that requirement, those requirements that were placed in front of them, that they all had to have living heirs, I would tend to say that this group would be older than would be typically seen in the spread of a Spartan army. Mm, mm. Right, so at the end of the day, Leonidas had effectively 300 Spartans and around 7,000 men onto, at minimum, 120,000, at max, probably around 300,000, with most of the Greek resistance concentrated from cities around the Peloponnese. So, uh, I mean, I guess, what's your thoughts on the strategy here? What were they trying to do? Were they trying to defeat? Were they trying to defeat them? Were they trying to block them? You know, there's a lot of things that are thrown around. All right, so here we are on the eve of battle with Leonidas getting ready to lead his 300 Spartans and their Greek allies, approximately 7,000 troops in total, to the narrow pass of Thermopylae. But also fully aware of what they were up against, this behemoth Persian force, depending on the estimates, as you mentioned, Elliot, 
somewhere in between 17 or up to 40 times larger than their number. And this raises all kinds of questions in terms of Leonidas's overarching strategy, why Thermopylae was selected as the location to make their stand, and interestingly, why both the Spartans and their Greek allies sent such a comparatively small force. Mm. So I'll speak to that first. Now, looking at the small numbers of the Greek coalition army, I think part of this is attributed to the fact that many Greek states, notably Argos, Achaea, Corinth, Atolia, and Crete, among others, they were sitting on the fence trying to figure out who was going to emerge victorious mm-hmm. and certainly not wanting to get on Xerxes' bad side if he was going to end up ruling Greece. That's part of it. But then why did the Spartans only send 300 when their citizen count was hovering at around 30,000 at this time? Surely they could have sent a much larger army because they in fact did later on in the subsequent battles mm-hmm. after Thermopylae. One of the main sticking points here is the same one that prevented their involvement in the Battle of Marathon a decade prior. It was due to the fact that the timing of the military operations for Thermopylae conflicted with the timing of the Spartan religious festival, the Carnea, that we talked about in the last episode. So being the God-fearing people that they were, or gods fearing people that they were, the Spartans only ended up sending a token force in the effort to avoid offending the gods. And now I have one other theory to run by you, Elliot, just to see what you think of this. Although I have no accounts substantiating this at all, I have a budding theory that the timing of this attack may have been a shrewd calculation on Xerxes' part since among his many advisors was the exiled Spartan king Demeritus. So it could have been that Xerxes purposely selected the timing that he did for Thermopylae, wagering that the Spartans wouldn't be able to attend in full force. Though admittedly, again, purely speculation on my part. What what are your thoughts? Yeah, I've never heard that. But I think, to be honest, that to me, that makes a lot of sense because it would mean that you know, even the Greek city-states that were kind of on the fence, they're more likely to say no because we've got our religious festivals, right? Right. I think that's a really good point. I've, n- I've never thought of that. didn't even come across it. <laughs> yeah, I just thought it was interesting because adding to this notion, when Darius I attacked a decade prior, it was also around this timing. Right. And we can only guess, maybe it was just coincidental, but certainly it took the Spartans out of the fight because they weren't even involved at all. So who knows? This is all possibility. It's all speculation. I like it. Yeah. I'm looking forward to your thesis on that next next year. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to start working on that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so again, speculation, but I think more concrete to this whole concept of the small Greek army at Thermopylae is that the numbers also don't take into consideration the adjoining military operation that was to Mm. take place at the same time, just off the coast, the naval battle at Artemisium that was about 50 kilometers to the east of Thermopylae. Because that invasion force that Xerxes assembled included amongst that number was 1,200 warships that the Mm. Greeks had decided to meet in battle as well. An Athenian-led naval coalition of around 270 ships. That's, I guess, part of it, the the low numbers. Uh, Do you have any thoughts to add there or even in terms of the selection of Thermopylae as the battle site? Yeah, I think originally the the site had been, from what I remember, further up. I think you're right. It was a strategic pass near Mount Olympus. That's kind of at the borderlands between northern Greece, Thessaly, and where the kingdom of Macedon began. That pass is quite similar to Thermopylae. It was dry, it was a gorge, it was the the idea of funneling Xerxes' troops into a narrow pass obviously was the plan all along, wherever they were going to go. Right. And Thermopylae was the one for it, without a doubt. It's a narrow gorge, there's cliffs on one side, the sea on the other. Yeah. Can't be flanked, not easily. And I think a lot of people, if you look up Thermopylae now, it's kind of hard to envision it now because it's much further inland. Back then it was right on the right on the cliff, right? 
right now it's to your point it's about a five kilometer distance from the sea from what i understand but at leonidas's time it was just 100 meters across from mm. from mount calidromo to the sea mm. Mm. So I think, yeah, that, that would probably be in my mind why it was so, you know, they picked this. It, it was definitely this place was picked on purpose. It's it's different terrain. To I know Xerxes has an army from across the world, but generally his his core soldiers, this is going to be a different terrain than what they're used to. It's it's hot. It's really dry. It's just scrubby, you know. It's like a, like a gorge. So it, they're aiming to use any advantage of the land that they can to kind of negate the, the small troop numbers they've got. I couldn't agree more. Mount Olympus, that pass in the north, I mean, that was foregone. That was abandoned, mm. that plan. It, the Greeks originally did actually send some forward forces there, but that place ended up being abandoned as far as where they were going to make their defensive stand because a number of reasons. I think there were, it was identified that there were many alternate routes around the pass at Mount Olympus, not to mention and this is quite significant, is that northern Thessaly had already thrown their support behind Xerxes mm. and that the area was teeming with forward Persian units and right. newly allied units as well. All of this resulted in Leonidas foregoing northern Greece to the Achaemenids, leaving it to them, and selecting Thermopylae as the battle site, as the main choke point between northern and central Greece. And adding to what you said, Elliot, I think both strategically and geographically, ultimately the best place to optimize the strengths of their hoplite warriors in terms of armor and toe-to-toe -to -toe infantry combat abilities, while at the same time negating the overwhelming advantage that the mm -hmm. Persians had in numbers and not allowing them to engage in any flanking maneuvers. Meaning that if the Persians were adamant about getting access to central and southern Greece, which of course they were, the only possible way was straight through that pass. Mm. And I think Leonidas intended to make the toll of passage extremely costly for the Achaemenids. So based on all of that and the research and, and the many theories put forward by historians on this battle, I'm not too sure where you stand on this, but I tend to lean heavily towards the notion that the defense put up by the Greek forces at Thermopylae was part of a broader master plan to grind down the Persian advance through attrition, chipping away at their enormous army as it moved deeper and deeper into Greece. Yeah, I definitely think so. As we've touched on, they had all the religious festivals at the moment, so they knew they weren't going to be able to get everyone, even if they wanted to, for a big battle. So it's a two-pronged approach. Can they, first of all, hold them off for as long as they can and give the states some time to you know, get everything together, wait for all the festivals to finish? And then as well as while they're doing that, perhaps Xerxes will be so demoralized by how many men he's losing in this meat grinder that it'll force him back. And I think just logistically as well, mm. Xerxes' army, incredibly large. We've already touched on that. So could you imagine the nightmare of maintaining those supply lines, mm. it, the, the logistical nightmare that went along with keeping such a large army fed and watered in field, in hostile territory, no less. That must have factored into this, Thermopylae providing the perfect choke point to do all that, delay Xerxes' army, but also inflict punishingly high losses among the Persians, while at the same time minimizing Greek casualties. Definitely. And I mean, you were saying before how Herodotus said they drank the rivers dry, and maybe they didn't exactly do that, but the, you know, it was a huge army. They couldn't stay in one place for, you know, for any given point in time. They needed to be moving, they needed to be resupplying based on the land and based on what they could get. So by holding them there, you know, by holding them anywhere, it's it's stopping that. Yeah. And at the same time, in view of that broader strategic master plan, also buying valuable time for the Greeks to organize and assemble mm. a much larger coalition army, including full Spartan participation, mm. but crowned off specifically for Leonidas. One more unique objective for him alone 
I think, keenly understanding his role in sacrifice to the state, the fulfillment of the oracle's prophecy, necessitating the death of a Spartan king as the price for preserving Sparta itself. Mm. And as Leonidas and his 300 made their final preparations to depart Sparta in late July 480 BC, I'm convinced that by this point, both he and his men were acutely aware that they would not be coming back. Mm. Now, this is partly explained through the criteria by which these warriors were selected for the task. Elliot, as you mentioned, requiring that they all had male living heirs so that their bloodlines wouldn't end with them. Mm -hmm. Um, We talked about how they were probably a little older in age, certainly Leonidas was, than would have been seen in a typical Spartan army. But beyond this, I suspect all of these men selected were also hardened veteran warriors, Mm. but also possessing unwavering dedication to the state, given the grim magnitude of what they were now facing. I think this is perhaps best illustrated by a story that comes to us from Plutarch. When Leonidas' wife, Gorgo, understanding of her husband's fate, what awaited him at Thermopylae, asked him what she was to do without him. Leonidas answered simply, Marry a strong man and bear strong children. Followed by Leonidas then leading his 300 Spartans on the 330-kilometer march northwards to Thermopylae, which is when each of them were given the customary farewell cry bestowed upon all Spartans before heading off on campaign to come back with your shield or on it, Mm, mm. meaning to return victorious or as a lifeless body slain in the attempt. Granted, this wasn't the entire group that Leonidas led north, along the way collecting their Helid attendants, Mm. some 4,000 Peloponnesian allied troops, and as they neared Thermopylae, adding hoplite contingents from the city-states of Thebes and Thespi amounting to that total force figure of around 7,000. Now, they arrived in the narrow pass in the scorching heat of early August, with the Achaemenids nowhere in sight. They were still making their approach southwards through Thessaly in northern Greece. And this gave Leonidas ample time to work on finalizing their defensive plans. Mm. Having also been joined by a group of local troops, from the nearby state called Phocis, around 1,000 of their soldiers that, interestingly, Leonidas did not keep with him. Instead, he ordered them to guard the only known alternate path around Thermopylae. This was a small, rough-hewn goat path cutting through Mount Calidromo, which protected their left flank, known to and used by only local shepherds while lastly using his troops to restore the old Phocian wall, originally constructed in the century prior, but it had since fallen into decay. Now, the Phocian wall was situated at one of the narrowest points between Mount Calidromo and the sea, and this was where Leonidas determined to make their stand, and it became an essential piece of his tactical plan, since with the wall repaired, this would enable him to intermittently cycle contingents of his troops Mm. in front of the walls to fight while resting others behind its protective barrier to keep his entire force as fresh as possible. And then they waited for days that turned into weeks with no news except for the occasional reports coming in from the Greek naval fleet at Artemisium that they too had not yet encountered their Persian counterparts. About two or three weeks later, however, in late August, Xerxes, at the head of his enormous army, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands strong, finally coming into view. I can imagine their march shaking the very ground, amidst horns blaring in the distance. Now, this is quite interesting because Their arrival was preceded by a handful of mounted Persian scouts who rode in closer to the pass and later reported back to Xerxes what they had seen. A surprisingly small Greek force, 
at the forefront with the 60-year-old Leonidas and his Spartans, seemingly not alarmed in the least by their appearance, but rather taking part in some light exercises, like wrestling, all oiled up and naked, (laughs) with others combing out their long hair as was their custom before battle. Now, this is followed by a more formal envoy, demanding that Leonidas submit to the king of kings and the might of the Achaemenid Empire, surrendering their arms. To which, one of my favorite lines, the Spartan king gave his famous laconic reply, come and get them. Xerxes, however, not immediately calling for attack, since he and his military advisors would have clearly understood that despite the relatively small Greek numbers, they were in an excellent defensive position, and that fighting under these conditions would be costly to his army. So they held back for about three days, perhaps thinking that their overwhelming numbers Mm. would unnerve the Greeks to eventually step aside. But Eventually, in the morning of the fourth day, however, the Persians finally coming to the exasperated conclusion that battle would be the only way, trying one last envoy, uttering the threat that there were so many archers in Xerxes' army that their arrows would darken the sky, which prompted another terse response from a Spartan warrior by the name of Dionysus, who looked to his king and comrade saying, good. We'll fight in the shade then. (laughs) There would be no further verbal sparring. Only battle left to provide the imminent solution. Here we are, Elliot, the Battle of Thermopylae. Good to be here, right. Did you kind of get the feeling that Xerxes, when he sends these scouts forward, he's almost amused by the Spartans and they're, you know, he's he kind of thinks it's almost like they're they're so deluded that to stand against him. It must have been comical to a certain degree. Anytime you have this clash of cultures, we already talked about how unique Spartans were considered within Greece in totality. Mm. They were so foreign in terms of their approach to everything. And now you have this Persian king who learns of, this is the group that you've selected to stand in defiance to the Mm. king of kings, to the Achaemenid Empire. But then there's another interesting aspect to that particular moment that I forgot to mention earlier. Because remember that among Xerxes' military advisors, this included the exiled Spartan king Demeritus. And when Xerxes learned of these few Spartan soldiers who were initially found in front of the Phocian wall, leisurely exercising naked, others grooming themselves barely acknowledging the Persian scouts that had found them that way. Xerxes later asked Demeritus, quite amused by the whole scene, why on earth would the Spartans be engaging in such seemingly bizarre, leisurely behavior on the eve of a battle against so formidable of an army? Demeritus then warned him not to take the Spartans lightly. And according to Herodotus, Demeritus said, one against one, they are as good as anyone in the world but when they fight in a body, they are the best of all. All of this, I would imagine, must have been quite bewildering to Xerxes. Almost insulting to him that he he gets dragged all the way here from Persia for this, almost, you know? Yeah, definitely. Right, so I think when, they're, when the Spartans were approaching, I'm not entirely sure of the geography, but I believe if they're heading around the coast, they would have been able to see this snake of men just that seemed almost endless. And that psychological factor of then standing there or camping there and waiting for several days. I mean, anyone who's not dedicated to the cause, they're leaving, aren't they? It's so fascinating. I imagine it by night. They're looking out into the horizon, meaning the Greeks, their coalition, the 300 Spartans. And they're seeing a sea of fires, campfires dotting the landscape as far as the eye Mm. can reach. And then by day, just seeing that enormity, that mass of humanity that's coming down to bear on them. And they're looking around at themselves and they only have 7,000. And then in the horizon, they see this, this insanely large Persian force bearing down on their position. You would think that it would have driven at least some to just 
give up and just say, okay, we're heading back until we can amass a larger army. But so great is perhaps the ability of Leonidas's his command to keep everything intact. Mm. I think that that's not something to be taken lightly. That mm. must have been an extremely important piece to this entire thing. Without a doubt, yeah. So the battle begins on August the 17th. Uh, it's, a, it's a hot, dusty gorge. And by the time Xerxes arrives, he sees these 300 Spartans in, in fan-like formation, right? They're in a tight, compact group, shields, shields shoulder to shoulder with long spears pointing out. And at first he sends in, you know, almost to just finish them off, right? He sends in these, his median soldiers. Now, I don't know if you got the same impression from me, Mark, that th these medians are almost from his heartland, right? They're not the best of the best, but still these are well-trained soldiers. They've got wicker shields and I think they kind of fight with a variety of weapons, spears mostly. Did you get that impression? Yeah, they're definitely probably the majority of his troops, more his regular troop contingent. I think in part what was part of the driving force for these soldiers to be selected is that they were used to mountain fighting. Mm. Within the lands of Persia, a lot of mountainous territories, and especially in comparison to Thermopylae, very similar configuration, dry, the mountainous areas, the limited passages, certainly that's reminiscent of their homeland as well. Mm. So I think in part that was why they were initially selected. But was your understanding as well, ultimately, they had some deficits, right? In facing mm. these Greek troops, they were more lightly armored than the yeah. Greeks. You mentioned their wicker shields. And yes, they used a variety of weapons, I think spears predominantly. But what's really important to consider there is that their spears were considerably shorter than what mm. the Greeks were using. Mm. Mm. So these these medians essentially they throw javelins first as as you usually do at the start of combat and we mentioned the Spartan shields are wood coated with I think it's brass or bronze 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 yeah bronze yeah. so it essentially just bounces off so they're forced to charge in and as we we said before right this is a gorge so there is no way to get around so it's man to man you know there's only a small combat width between them there's nothing else that can be done you've got to fight one on one. So Leonidas signals a, a strike back and, you know, as he pushes back, it shatters all these, um, the, the shields of all the medians, right? Pushes them right back, you know, blood and entrails fill this gorge. And as Xerxes watches this, wow. he, he stands up from his throne in shock. Herodotus actually says that. He just can't believe what he's seeing. He has just been like completely repelled by these, you know, tiny group of men. Wow. So as the day kind of goes on, he keeps sending more and more of these people through, and it's just not getting anywhere. So he brings in, I think this is everyone's favorite, the Immortals, right? Yeah. Uh, now, I didn't actually get what the Immortals, in, in terms of the armor they wore, maybe you know a bit about that. I, I know they were called the Immortals because their numbers were so numerous that if one fell, they'd instantly be replaced. So, you know, they, they were immortal. Yeah, 10,000 soldiers, the elite of the elite mm. of the Persian army, certainly more heavily armored than the other troops in Xerxes' army. They were extremely skilled. They would be selected from the various units, those that had distinguished themselves within the regular Persian army, and then selected for the 10,000 immortals. Their numbers always kept at 10,000. So if someone fell, they would immediately be replaced by whoever was the next best in line. Mm. But they were exceptional archers, great at fighting overall famed for their battle prowess and dedication to their Achaemenid monarchs, also serving an important dual purpose, as the Imperial Guard when not on campaign, and in times of war as the absolute best soldiers of the Persian army, called upon for the most difficult tasks when a breakthrough was needed. Mm, mm. I can't help but get out of my head as much as I try in 300, they're presented as almost ninjas, right? They've got like, uh, I think they've got dual katanas and like a, a silver kind of, um, you know, mask. <laughs> I don't know if they had that, but they were certainly top of the line, right? 100%, you're correct. They were more heavily armored, their equipment of the finest quality. Certainly, this would have set them apart and be distinctive from the mass. But yes, no jeweled katanas and definitely not ninjas. <laughs> so, um... 
virtually these men face the same, the exact same issues that the medians did. They come up against this wall. No one, is, no one is giving an inch, right? Every single Spartan is holding the shield right to the, you know, to the shoulder of the person standing next to them. They can't make any headway. They've got these enormously long spears being pressed against them, and the, mm-hmm. just like just like the ones that came before them, they're absolutely sorted, right? And this is a, a tiny, thin gully. You're going to be seeing everyone. If you're coming up in a line, almost like a meat grinder, you're seeing the person two in front of you. He's dead. Wait a few more minutes. That guy's dead. And their bodies are just all over the floor. And you, you know, the psychological impact of that must be must be huge. Oh, without a doubt. So by by the, by the time the day ends, you know, the sun's setting, and Xerxes is, is you know astonished by what he's seen, and you kind of get the impression that. Demaritus is almost a bit like, well, I told you, this is what was going to happen. <laughs> I was going to ask you, what do you think the casualties were looking like? I'm picturing this day one in my mind. And from what I understand, the casualties, even though it was a full day of fighting, the Persians sending wave upon wave, first the mm. Medes, and then the immortals called upon to do that heavy lifting. And they're just getting... When you say a meat grinder, I think that's a perfect illustration of what was happening. But what do you think the losses were looking like for the Greek coalition at this point? I didn't read any sources that, that gave specific numbers. But if we look at ancient battles, the route is usually where the men drop on mass, right? When it's a shield wall to a shield wall, there's just a stab here. And then that person's dragged back. And another person goes in front. But for a whole unit to be rotated out, if for the medians to be pulled back and another one to come in, that must be some real numbers. I mean, I don't even want to speculate. What do you think? I think they were extremely high for the Persians. I think they were extremely light for the Greeks. Mm. The advantage in armor cannot be underestimated yeah. and their shields as well. The advantage that the Greek hoplites had in terms of toe-to-toe reach, the greater length of their spears, that's another important factor. I'll touch upon this a bit later, but I think by the time the first two days of battle were completed, the losses for the total Greek force were maybe about somewhere in between 30 to 40 percent of their force and much less so in day one. Mm. They were just dominating that pass. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we didn't talk too much about that on armor, did we? But essentially, it's a trade-off between being bogged down and, in this case, incredibly hot, wearing these you know breastplates and greaves, as opposed to you know not wearing much but being able to be more nimble. And you can see by how day one went, which which one. <laughs> yeah, and to your point, that's why the the javelins being thrown upon them, the arrows that are being rained down on the Greek forces are doing actually very little damage Mm. throughout the course of that first day. That is an important piece to this entire battle. I mean, it was perfectly selected as well, right? That's why Thermopylae ended being such an ideal spot. Mm. It maximized the benefits and protection of the Greeks. The only way that the Persians were going to do something, it wasn't going to be head on. It was if they could somehow get around them, which all their attempts were being thwarted at this point. Mm. Mm. So day two begins, and by this point, the battle must have been littered with putrefying body parts because hot heat, fecal matter, blood, it's going to be a real gully of just horror. Definitely. Xerxes forms up this kind of all-star squad from all the different races and nations that he controls, and I, I think he does this to impress upon the Spartans the breadth of the men that he can call under. You know, you've got wild Celtic Scythians in their gold jewelry formed up next to veiled Arabian warriors, jet black Ethiopians next to Egyptians, and all manner of Greeks as well fighting these Spartans. And these men have just all standing ready. And although these are being picked from the best, you know, these are the best of the best of their own units, they're not trained together. And I think that's something Xerxes missed. They they all fight in their own styles and they all fight in their own way. They're not working as um, a solid unit like the the Spartan hoplites are. Well said. The Greeks, that's what their soldiers were. They were hoplites. Mm. All Greek citizens, that's what they fought as. Granted, the Spartans, it was even a, a completely different echelon of warrior, as we illustrated in the first episode. But mm. they were, I would say, clearly the best type of infantry soldier between the two nations by far. 
And this is what led to such great casualties among Xerxes' forces, particularly in those first two days, and what allowed the Greeks to maintain their cohesiveness mm. and remain as a unified group with Leonidas at the same time, trying to keep them as fresh as possible. Because th these are days of constant fighting. Mm, mm. And so the only way that Leonidas was able to keep his troops somewhat rested was to keep on cycling them in front of the walls and other units to the behind the Phokian wall and keep on doing that throughout the course of the day when there were breaks in the fighting where they could do so. Yeah, yeah. They're going behind that wall to get some water, maybe some food, Rather than, yeah. I mean, Xerxes doesn't need to do this because they're dying too quick, to be honest. There's no there's no need yes. to cycle them out. But on this day particularly, Leonidas employs this tactic of feigned retreat to break formation. So I don't know about you, but when I read about feigned retreats in battles, they're usually Mongols or, you know, riders from the steppe. So to do this yeah. with people yeah. with huge, huge long spears, this is this is a tough thing. So what essentially I don't know the impression that you got, but I got the impression they kind of gave ground almost like they were starting to falter a bit and maybe one you know, shoulder or something of the group might fall back and it would create a bit of a vortex, a bit of a gully. All the Persian troops would kind of run in and think they've got them on the run. And then all of a sudden the Spartans would wheel back on Leonidas's command and just you know cut them to pieces. I think this speaks to two interesting pieces of spartan strategy and warfare deception and exceptional drilling and mm. training so to your point i believe that there was a number of sequences and the spartans would utilize this quite consistently when facing different groups of persian warriors this is unbelievable to comprehend but they were appearing to falter mm. somehow losing their formation, but knowing exactly what they were doing. The, the Spartans were notorious for this. And then the Persians would see them starting to waffle and rush forward in pursuit. The Spartans are falling back, but then a command is uttered. Leonidas shouts out a command mm. to reform their ranks, and they just turn with precision mm. and just cut down whoever is pursuing them incredible execution that the Spartans alone were known for against Greek adversaries mm. doing elaborate complex formations that no one else could even conceive. And they were doing this at Thermopylae to a devastating effect. Mm. And it's so risky, right? Because if you don't reform on time or, you know, this can really turn into a route, you could actually be in a lot of trouble if, you know, you don't adhere to those those orders exactly when they're meant to be just shows the you know the regiment drilling they've been exposed to they know exactly already when to when to do it yeah well i guess when you do it day in day out every single day from seven up until 60 or whatever age that one is at you're gonna get pretty darn good at it i guess yeah yeah you are so as all this is progressing right the second day has progressed more or less you know, the same as the first, probably with a few more casualties from the Spartan side. Everyone's a bit more tired. But as they're doing this, Xerxes is approached by a man, a Greek man. His name is Ephialtes. Ephialtes now in modern Greek means nightmare. So you can imagine uh, you can imagine what this guy's about to do. In the same way we say Judas is someone who betrays someone, right? So mm -hmm. and he approaches Xerxes. He, he's from somewhere a bit further north of the Peloponnese. He approaches Xerxes with this offer to, you know, he sees Xerxes has not been doing well over the last few days, and he offers to show him this secret pass. And this pass mark is the one that you were talking about, the old, the old goat track around. And Xerxes agrees. I mean, why wouldn't he? It's not going well here. So Xerxes' troops are guided by Ephialtes through this goat pass, essentially around the gorge. So they they go all the way around the back. It's quite a long pass, quite up into the hills. It's, you know, single file. It's not meant for armies, but they do get there. So Leonidas had assigned a group of Phokian Greeks to guard this pass, but from what I understand, it is, it is a bit written about this, they're taken by surprise, right? They're overwhelmed. Yeah, the immortals are the ones that are selected to travel this mm. goat path in the midst of the night of the second day. Mm. And you're right, the Phokians are completely surprised by their presence. They were not anticipating this. and. From what I read, the 
immortals proceeded to pepper them with arrows mm. and the Phokians understanding the enormity of what was approaching them, these 10,000 immortals that were traveling through the path, they tried to move to a higher ground area where they thought it was going to be a lot harder for the Persian warriors to get to them. Mm. And the Persian warriors just passed on through. They didn't even engage with the Phokians had moved higher up land and understanding what they did, they essentially gave up the pass. Mm without much of a fight yeah yeah and i kind of, i got the impression well from what i read there's a few people that almost blame leonidas for this you know why did he send the phokians there but the guy only had 300 spartans what's it going to be it doesn't there's no last stand of 270 spartans and the 30s sit <laughs> on the pass is there do you think there's any truth to that it's an interesting notion whether leonidas if you look at everything he had done he executed everything so well but Perhaps one of the misses was not at least including one Spartan overseer mm. to that of the Phokians. But I mean, you could contrast that as well in the sense that what is one Spartan commander going to do, mm. you know, overseeing even a thousand Phokian warriors when you have 10,000 Persian immortals mm. that are breaking through the pass in order to block them, you would have needed a sizable force, probably a collection of Spartans there. And to your point, how can you split up the 300 Spartans and still make them into an effective fighting force when the main assault is coming through the pass of Thermopylae? Mm, mm. Question for the ages. But the point is, when the sun rises, Leonidas and the 300 Spartans, are, they're caught in a pincer. They've got nowhere to go. There's the enemy on one side, and now the enemy is behind them. So I'll start painting this picture now into the very early morning of the third day as the darkened sky began showing hints of dawn this is when the aged spartan king received word from a breathless phokian runner that the persians had discovered and broken through the mountain goat pass reporting the elite persian immortals thousands of them filtering in by the way of this alternate route and that in the approaching hours, Leonidas's forces were about to be surrounded, trapped within the hot gates. Now, I'm not sure what your impression of this is, but from what I can imagine, Leonidas probably not showing much of a reaction, accepting the news calmly, understanding that this was the end and what was expected of him and his warriors. Yeah, I agree. I think it's it's fulfilling a prophecy he was expecting, right? It had to come soon. I don't think he knew it would come that day, but he knew it must have been coming. I couldn't agree more because within this was also an opportunity for him to fulfill the oracle's sacrificial requirement. At the same time, giving both he and his men the chance to achieve what the Spartans considered a beautiful death a concept related to fighting with reckless heroics, even when confronted with certain death, in the aim of winning immortal fame. And so as the Spartans began rousing from their slumber, Leonidas reportedly awakened them to the news of their impending fate, ending with another of his famous sayings, telling his men to ready themselves, saying, Eat a quick breakfast, for tonight we shall feast in the underworld. Before calling a council and dismissing their Greek allies to evacuate the field, advising that the Spartans were going to stay, also providing the rear guard to allow for their escape. And this is the point at which somewhere in between 2,500 to 3,000 Greek warriors departed. But interestingly, not everyone going along with this exodus. Notably, the hoplites from Thespi and Thebes bravely determined to stay to the end, perhaps inspired mm. by their Spartan counterparts. And a lesser known fact was that the Spartan slave attendants, the helots, also remained, though I tend to doubt that they were given much of a choice in the matter. Mm. All of this adding up, contrary to popular belief, not just what was left of the 300 Spartans that would put up this incredible last stand, 
but still a Greek coalition of some 1,200 to 1,500 men. That Leonidas again led out to assemble beyond the Phocian Wall. And who all together, as the searing late summer sun arose in the third day, came to view this incredibly grisly scene around them, accompanied by that putrid stench of blood, sweat, and corpses laying on the grounds outside the wall. Where, by this point, we touched upon this before, but while estimates widely vary, somewhere in between 30 to 40 percent of the original Greek army had already fallen, about 2,500 soldiers potentially. Granted, this is a figure that was significantly dwarfed by the Persian losses. But yet, to their credit, did little to dissuade the Persian troops that also bravely marched Mm. out to again fiercely assault the Greek position. Perhaps smelling blood in the water, emboldened by the understanding that their adversaries would soon be surrounded. And while the Greeks led by Leonidas and his Spartans, continued to put up a remarkably valiant resistance. As the morning hours progressed, their formations and energy finally began to fray at the edges. Since now, possessing fewer numbers, Leonidas was prevented from cycling Mm. his units in and out of the front as he did before. Not to mention that the majority of their weapons and equipment had been Mm. rendered useless spears shattered, shields broken, increasingly unable to fight as a phalanx, and starting to wilt under the Achaemenid waves of assault. Mm. Followed by Leonidas himself in the thick of battle, killed by Persian archers, and his body falling to the ground, and this resulted in the two sides surging forward to recover it in what can only be imagined as a gruesome and primal clash, wherein a few Spartan warriors succeeded in claiming the corpse of their king. But this is before, altogether, abandoning their position at the Phocian Wall, upon learning of the arrival of the Persian immortals at their backs. And so, at this point, the few Greeks remaining, I mean, we can only guess at their number, perhaps a few hundred remaining, they proceeded to drag Leonidas's body to a raised alcove or bluff against the base of Mount Calidromo. And they ended up surrounded by a sea of Persian warriors. But according to Herodotus, with the Spartans and their fellow Greek warriors fighting to the last man, some wielding swords and knives, others broken spears, some with only their bare hands and teeth, but all fighting with frenzied heroics, as if demons possessed. And while what was left of the Theban hoplites ended up surrendering around this point, the last stand of the Thespians, the Spartan helots, and of course, the Spartans themselves, only ended upon being slain by the Achaemenid troops, and the Battle of Thermopylae thus coming to its end. Technically, yes, a victory for Xerxes, since he now controlled the strategic pass, gaining entry into central Greece, but a victory that came at an astonishingly steep cost to his army. Mm. 4,000 Greek lives in exchange for an estimated 20,000 Achaemenid troops laying dead on the battlefield. And whereas most accounts of this incredible last stand tend to finish everything off here, romanticizing the post-mortem glory poured upon Leonidas and his 300 warriors, those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. While certainly fitting isn't entirely accurate, being that not all of the 300 were killed at Thermopylae. Mm. Two Spartan warriors, Pantites and Aristodemus, managing to survive through the ordeal. But we'll get to their stories a little later on. Right. So what happened after the Battle of Thermopylae? Here's a couple of the more immediate outcomes to help us tie up some loose ends. For the Theban hoplites, or what was left of them, that surrendered during the closing moments of the battle, Xerxes had them branded, literally branded, as subjects of the Achaemenid Empire before allowing them to return home. 
perhaps as a form of psychological warfare or an attempt to sow fear in the population and show the futility of resisting him. Right. Then there was a naval battle that had been raging 50 kilometers off the coast of Thermopylae, 270 Greek vessels against a Persian armada of 1,200 warships. For that battle, while it wasn't considered a victory for the Greek coalition, has been labeled more so as a tactical stalemate. Since the Greeks, despite losing about 100 ships, managed to destroy approximately two Persian vessels for each one of theirs, helped greatly by a storm that claimed 200 or more Persian warships. And while this seriously weakened the Achaemenid fleet by a count of around 400, a third of their original number, it didn't prevent their ability to continue on the invasion of Greece. And lastly, what became of Leonidas' body? Although the typical Persian practice was to treat worthy fallen foes with honour and respect, Xerxes, in a fit of rage over the stubborn resistance and huge losses inflicted on his army, orchestrated by the Spartan king, ordered Leonidas' body decapitated and set on a pike at Thermopylae, a grisly symbol marking his triumph there over the famed Spartans, the best and most feared warriors to be found in Greece. Interestingly, once news began to spread in the days and weeks that followed about what had happened, with the Greeks and the Spartans led by Leonidas had managed to achieve, their incredible last stand, fighting to the bitter end, fearless in the face of terrifyingly bleak odds, dragging 20,000 Persians into the underworld. Although technically a defeat, in many ways the Battle of Thermopylae was ultimately a huge victory for the Greek world due to the following. First, the more practical wins, such as high casualties caused to Xerxes' forces, and the fact that they were delayed for so long at Thermopylae, which put great strain on the enormous field army needing to be sufficiently fed and watered. Yeah, definitely. Secondly, it provided a key point of, let's say, belief behind the ability and the determination of the Greeks not only to withstand the Achaemenid invasion, but also significantly expand their response. In that, taking Thermopylae as a talisman, if so few Greek warriors could inflict such a stinging loss upon the Persians, imagine what a larger Greek coalition could do. A notion made stronger by the galvanizing of wider cooperation among the normally fickle city-states of Greece, helping to convince some that had been previously sitting on the fence like Argos and Corinth, and even Thessaly that had earlier thrown their support behind the Persians to instead join the Greek coalition. And finally, the ferocity and the sacrifice of Greek troops at Thermopylae is said to have instilled a great fear among the Persians, by contrast, serving as an inspiring rally cry to their fellow Greek warriors in subsequent battles that were to follow. And while Xerxes would indeed proceed southwards deeper into Greece, eventually sacking Athens, the Greek coalition victories at the naval battle of Salamis in September 480 BC and the land battles in the following year, at Plataea and Mycale in 479 BC. It's of note that they were won by impressively large Spartan-led Pan-Hellenic armies, 80,000 and 40,000 strong respectively. These would ultimately defeat the Xerxes' invasion of Greece, with the Achaemenids pushed all the way out of mainland Europe by 479 BC, never to return. And just to add on to what you mentioned, Elliot, I think a final reference to the vital importance of Leonidas, the Spartans, and all that fell at Thermopylae in view of the broader sequence of events coming to us from the ancient Greek historian Diodorus Siculus, who wrote, One would be justified in believing that it was these men who were more responsible for the common freedom of the Greeks than those who were victorious at a later time in the battles against Xerxes. For when the deeds of these men were called to mind, the Persians were dismayed, whereas the Greeks incited to perform similar courageous exploits. So, here we are, at the end of Leonidas' story, the Battle of Thermopylae and its immediate aftershocks. But perhaps begging the question, what became of Sparta? And in case you're wondering about that, here's a bit of a quick synopsis just to wrap everything up. Following the defeat of Persia, for the next 50 years, both Sparta and Athens emerged as the strongest and most militant city-states in Greece, resulting in a fierce collision between them, 
vying for dominance, kicked off in 431 BC called the Peloponnesian War, essentially the ancient Greek equivalent to that of a world war. That Sparta would ultimately win in 404, establishing themselves as the masters of Greece, also referred to as the Spartan hegemony Mm. of Greece. But having reached the apex of their power at a tremendous cost to the Spartan army, hemorrhaging its citizen population base, since they had been involved in so many battles to get there in such a short period of time. The Spartan population thus whittled down to just under 10,000 by the turn of the 4th century, and that eroded further due to their newfound position, which forced them to become an active player on a bigger stage necessitating Sparta's involvement in a dizzying amount of political issues and altercations all across Greece and the Aegean, steadily sapping at their number and strength, and later with the veneer of their military invincibility shattered forever when defeated at the Battle of Leuctra in 371 BC by the polis of Thebes that took over the hegemony of Greece. With that title shortly afterwards, being relinquished to Philip II of Macedon, who spurred the rise of Macedon, the empire that his son Alexander the Great would take to even greater heights, also reducing the Achaemenid Empire to ashes. And while throughout this period, Sparta still managed to survive as an independent nation, their role was more so as a nominal power in Greece, a shell of their former glorious selves consisting of a much reduced population, according to some estimates as low as a mere 1,000 Spartan citizens. It had just been too much for them, Mm. trying to maintain that their hegemony that had costed them ultimately everything. I think that in combination with the Peloponnesian War, truly, you know, it's amazing, right? You think about it, you reach the apex of their power, and that became their undoing Mm. in a way. Mm. Couldn't keep it up. Absolutely. And as a result, they were increasingly unable to hold back the tide of revolting helots, losing their territories to them and various Greek adversaries that by the dawning of the 2nd century BC had reduced Sparta's territorial extent to the lands just around their city. And with Sparta's political independence finally coming to an end upon being defeated in the Laconian War by a collection of Greek city-states headlined by the Roman Republic, Mm. who overthrew Sparta's final king, King Nabus, in 192 BC. So, we've talked about Leonidas, the Battle of Thermopylae. Now we've seen the end of Sparta itself after so many centuries at you know, climbing to the apex, maintaining it through their amazing military, now reduced to ashes and fallen completely, even politically. I think this is a fitting place for for us to expand on Leonidas's legacy mm. and perhaps talk about some of our final thoughts and maybe some of the things that struck us profoundly in terms of his lifetime. Yeah, I think it's there's something about his story that makes it addictive to to learn about. I mean, there's so many other people that died for for causes. I mean, you know, this story that is the real last stand. I think it's because you know, Leonidas he was never meant to be king of Sparta, but he took on the mantle with such dedication and just embraced all the sacrifices that came with it. It was a new role for him and everything that he got with it, he he took it on. I think the pithy comebacks to Xerxes' demands, the extreme imbalance of power, and the reason behind what he fought for, freedom, that's what makes it so so interesting and so relatable. It's something we'd never want to lose as a person. The combination of all those things as things we like to read about, we like to hear about. Everyone likes an underdog story. Everyone likes to get yeah. behind someone th- that is fighting the status quo. You know, At the end of the day, Leonidas was... He was a true warrior king. He didn't sit at his palace and send out men to fight for him. He he went and he went in and did it himself. So today the Thermopylae Pass is geographically very different to what it looked like during Leonidas' time. 
but where the battle took place is marked by a plaque. Next to that plaque is a stone line that commemorates Leonidas's men, and the plaque bears the inscription, Go tell the Spartans passerby that here, obedient to our laws, we lie. I think as such, it's really one of those goosebumps quotes, isn't it? It's really quite so powerful. It's, it's one sentence. It's pretty much, we did our duty, and, and what a duty it was. What a fitting monument marking the Greek sacrifice there. In particular, that simple stone slab sitting just inches above the ground, bearing the epitaph that you mentioned, Elliot, in commemoration of Leonidas and the Spartans. One might think, considering the enormity of what they had accomplished at Thermopylae, that this would have warranted a monument on a much grander scale. Mm. However, in my mind, this fits exactly with the Spartan ideal. It's nothing ostentatious, quite sparse Mm. really. Even the words used for the epitaph, an excellent example of laconic speech. Which, perhaps is precisely why it fits with the Spartan ideal so perfectly. Not overtly emphasizing their individual military exploits, Mm. but still alluding to the eternal glory that their fallen king and his warriors had gained for themselves in service to the Spartan state. Mm. Besides that, there's one more statue for specifically Leonidas himself. It's a bronze statue. Uh, You've got Leonidas wearing the traditional hoplite helmet and armor. I believe his spear is raised above his head, and it just says on the statue on the base underneath, in Greek, come and take them. In regards to what happened to Leonidas, I believe his remains were brought back to Sparta. Is that right? Yeah, about 40 years after his death. From what I understand, they were brought back to Sparta. Yeah. And they had, I think, quite the celebration of his life, but more so how he died, I think, Mm. for Sparta and Spartans, I think it's hard to argue against the notion that Leonidas, essentially from the moment he fell in battle, immediately became the standard by which all Spartan kings, before and after him, were measured. And um, Once his body was brought back, he was deified in a way, and the Leonidia festival was created to honor him annually for the next two or so centuries. It's really quite interesting as well because after Sparta was conquered by Rome, Trajan, the greatest conqueror of all Rome, re-implemented this this ceremony at his own cost. So it goes to show that even then people were thinking this is a story that's that you know has some allure to it. When you look at some of the greatest warriors of history, Leonidas, I think for many people, I think it, in a similar vein to that of Alexander the Great, mm. Mm. the amazing stories how how inspiring their tales were to so many military leaders not just military leaders but just to so many people that are you know history enthusiasts but also future military leaders that saw these people what they achieved such an inspiring notion Mm -hmm. that drove their or perhaps even impacted their actions from there on in we're talking about inspiring people for eons Mm -hmm. afterwards it's hard to find a story that is more inspiring and incredible than their famous last stand. Mm, mm. I mean, and this is, what are we, two and a half thousand years later or something, and we're still yeah. talking about it. There's paintings, books, poetry, movies. You know, it's Leonidas's bravery and dutifulness raise questions as to, I suppose, whether it was him or whether it was Spartan upbringing, but... I mean, the word laconic that originates from, we use that word to describe when something is short and kind of pithy. Uh, Spartan yeah. today, I don't know about in Canada, but in Australia, we have a line yeah. of products. If they're Spartan, it means, you know, basic, bare bones, functional. Yeah. So for me, when thinking about Leonidas's legacy and everything that it conjures up in the mind, the incredible heroics and bravery he exhibited throughout the entirety of the Battle of Thermopylae. While certainly impressive and deserving, one of the thoughts that strikes me as fascinating is just how different he might have been regarded historically had he faltered, Mm. even for reasons beyond his control. How differently he would have been viewed by his contemporaries throughout Greece, but especially in Sparta, wherein 
after his death, he was unequivocally celebrated as essentially the perfect symbol for everything that Sparta stood for, its system, values, and ideals, a sentiment equally placed upon the 300 Spartans that had accompanied him. Well, not quite all of them, Mm. but rather almost all of them, since, as we mentioned a little while ago, there were two glaring exceptions to this notion, Pantides and Aristodemus, the two Spartan warriors that had survived Thermopylae, both of whom we can reasonably assume, given the circumstances and the fact that no historical accounts state otherwise, fought quite valiantly up to and including the second day of battle, but were then prevented from dying alongside their countrymen on the third day. Pentides sent away on a messenger errand, and Aristodemus, who came down with some type of eye affliction that rendered Mm. him temporarily blind. Now, despite both following what was commanded and expected of them to the best of their abilities, When they returned to Sparta, they were both received in dishonor, resulting in Pantides hanging himself out of shame. And as for Aristodemus, although he didn't do that, choosing instead to go out in a blaze of glory during the Battle of Plataea, Herodotus singling him out as the bravest of all warriors in the battle, even that was insufficient in the eyes of the Spartans to regaining his honor, being that the stain of not falling at Thermopylae remained, never to be erased. Standing in stark contrast to Leonidas's legacy, although separated by mere degrees to the fate of the two survivors, served as the ultimate example of one whose story and dedication, his unfaltering adherence to Spartan law, and willingness to sacrifice his life for the state made him so exalted among his Mm. contemporaries. I think a significant factor that has allowed his legend to persist to this day. So we're here at the end. And before we close everything off, Elliot, I just wanted to take a moment to say how much of a pleasure it was to work with you on Leonidas's story. And I think it would be great if you could give my listeners a little bit of a summary of what your podcast, The Anthology of Heroes, is all about and where they can find out more about you and your show. Yeah, happy to, mate. It's always fun chatting history, isn't it? Particularly with people who want to chat history rather than just forcing it on your friends and family, which I'm sure you're as guilty as me of doing. Anthology of Heroes is all about people who fought against the odds. Leonidas is probably the most well-known of these figures, but world history is rammed full of figures just like him. A few of our episodes, which are kind of crowd favourites, are the Revolt at Sobibor concentration camp, where a group of Jews successfully planned and executed a flawless breakout of their prison. Murdering the Nazi guards with homemade hatchets and stolen rifles, this would be the most successful escape attempt in the dark history of the Holocaust. There's also the story of the Seminole tribe, the so-called unconquered people who waged an unending war against the United States government to hold on to their land, slipping deeper and deeper into the Florida swamps where they still remain to this day. But, I mean, my personal favourite is our five-part series on the Reconquista, the so-called re-Christianisation of Spain following the collapse of Muslim rule. In that series, over a 700-year period, we tell the story of the Reconquista, In the first episode, we follow the life of a Romano-Gothic captain in command of the very last holdout of Christianity in the extreme north of the country. Then we follow the life of a maverick known as El Cid, who served both Muslim and Christian, depending on pay. Despite this conflicting loyalty, he'd be remembered as one of Spain's greatest heroes to this day. And finally, we walk with Bob Dill, the last Muslim king left in Spain in his sad exodus back to Africa after the entirety of the peninsula had been recaptured by Christians. The narrative for all our stories are constructed to help you feel what it was really like to walk in these people's shoes. Each episode is immersive with sound effects and music to really take you there. And like your show, Mark, all our sources are on our website. So to Mark's listeners, have a listen and let me know what you think. Shoot me a message if you've come over from Warlords.
in the next episode. As much as I've enjoyed the collaboration here with Elliot, diving into Leonidas' lifetime, ancient Sparta, and the Battle of Thermopylae, I hope you're as excited as I am to be returning back to the Roman Republic and the continuation of our series on Scipio Africanus. With what the young Scipio would have seen and experienced as a part of his father's army, getting his first real taste of war, attempting to chase down the invasion force of the Carthaginian general Hannibal Barca at the dawning of the Second Punic War in 218 BC, wherein we'll start by going back in time to get a better understanding of what Carthage had been up to after losing the First Punic War, and how their subsequent aggressive expansion in the Iberian Peninsula, championed by Hamilcar Barca, made the Carthaginian Empire stronger than ever. With the leadership over the Carthaginian holdings in Hispania, later placed into the hands of his son Hannibal, who put together a frighteningly formidable army that he boldly used to instigate war with Rome, before embarking on one of the most audacious marches in military history, seeking from modern Spain to, unbelievably, take the war to Rome by the way of a land invasion, and ultimately force his way into Italy through the treacherous peaks of the Alps mountain range. In the lead up to the first battle of the Second Punic War, the Battle of Ticinus in late 218 BC, where Scipio would witness firsthand Hannibal's forces handing his father's army a heavy loss that also left his father severely wounded, only saved from certain death by the recklessly heroic actions of his 19-year-old son. This and more to follow in the next episode of the Warlords of History podcast. And while waiting for part two of the series on Scipio Africanus to drop, I would highly recommend having a listen of Elliot's podcast, Anthology of Heroes, which I'll include a link to in the show notes, wherein Elliot does an exceptional job of taking his listeners through epic journeys in history, telling the stories of people from ancient up to modern times, whose bravery, actions, and determination to stand up for what they believed in has led to them being hailed as heroes. And lastly, if you want to support the Warlords of History podcast, there are many ways you can help. You can tell your family and friends about the show. Please rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you happen to access the show on. You can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And finally, you can head on over to the show's website, warlordsofhistory.com, where on the support section of the site, you can find the show's Patreon or PayPal links in the event that you want to contribute to the podcast directly. But beyond this, where I'll include some additional info, like images and maps pertaining to this episode for your viewing pleasure and where you can also reach out to me with any thoughts, questions, or suggestions. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Theme music from Audionautics.com And because you're still here, having patiently listened through the ending sequence, you're in for a little treat. Because Elliot and I just couldn't resist. We promised each other how many times we were going to hold ourselves to a limit of two. This is Sparta's <laughs> per episode. But okay, I'll lay one down here and then maybe you can better mine. Okay, okay let's go. So this is Sparta. How was that? Well, I like it. The accent's quite good. It's quite powerful. Yeah, I was trying to go very aggressive there. Right. I just, I didn't do it with my shirt off because... <laughs> you know the abs are not quite there yet i'm working on that's it for the patron yeah. that's for the patrons, oh yeah it? yeah <laughs> only fans i'm i'm thinking of starting that i like it i like it all right i'll do mine all right i'm gonna stand back so i don't blow your eardrums yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> this is sparta oh man how was that you had some like <laughs> when you delivered sparta a lot of you know i, I heard that like variation in the delivery i was impressed <laughs> Oh, thank you, thank you. That's right. I think we'll have to we'll let the audience judge which was better. Yeah. <laughs>